Tonight, live from Ukraine, where Russia's escalating attacks on civilians as peace talks stall. The shocking video showing Russia mortar shells hitting a bridge as residents tried to flee a city near Kyiv. What the group of New York Times journalists caught in the middle told NBC News about the horrific attack. Plus, the alarming new report that Russia may be recruiting fighters from Syria as Putin continues to try and take control of Ukraine's capital. Another round of peace talks ending with little to no progress. Nearly two million refugees have now fled Ukraine, more than half of them children. Ukraine rejecting Russia's offer to evacuate civilians to key cities in Russia and Belarus. Also tonight, hundreds of students from India trapped in eastern Ukraine without access to food and clean water. The students now melting snow and drinking it. What's being done to get them out? The crisis causing record-breaking gas prices. The average cost of a gallon of regular now more than $4.10. Some pumps in Los Angeles at $7 a gallon. How the White House is responding tonight. Deadly storm, several people killed after a, a monster tornado touched down in Iowa. There are now bracing for another round of severe weather with nearly 40 million people from Mississippi to New Jersey on alert for thunderstorms, damaging winds and possible tornadoes. And the Supreme Court declining to review the decision that freed Bill Cosby from prison. Is this the end of his legal battles? Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin another week live from Ukraine, where Russia's escalating attacks on Ukrainian cities and its people. A journalist capturing the moment Russian shelling hit a bridge near Kyiv. The bridge used by residents. You saw right there what happened, including families who were trying to escape with young children trying to flee the city. U.S. officials say all troops Russia amassed around the border are inside Ukraine as Putin continues to try and take Kyiv. A new report from The Wall Street Journal saying Russia is now recruiting fighters from Syria well-versed in urban warfare to help. More than 1.7 million people have fled Ukraine in less than two weeks, the fastest-growing humanitarian crisis in Europe since World War II. The war also having economic impacts at home. The average price of a gallon of gas in the U.S. now more than $4.10, higher than the previous record set back in 2008. Talks between Ukraine and Russia ended today after about four hours and with no major progress. And just moments ago, Ukraine's President Zelensky posting this video to his Instagram showing he is still at his office in Kyiv saying, quote, I am not afraid of anyone. Let's get right to Richard Engel, who leads us off tonight from Ukraine. Russian troops are now on Kiev's doorstep, and they're trying to break in through a suburb called Irpin. And this slippery row of planks is the only way for civilians to get out. The Ukrainians blew up this bridge in order to slow down the Russian advance, but it has also made it extremely difficult for people to evacuate these areas that are hotly contested. Civilians today were crossing in wheelchairs or carried out. But even as they escape, Russian troops keep firing on them. This disturbing video yesterday captured what Russia is unleashing on civilians fleeing its onslaught. In the background, you see people running down the sidewalk, leaving Irpin. And then this. A mortar strike. Ukrainian soldiers move in to help. But on that sidewalk, at least four people, three from one family, lie dead. Those who made it out today loaded onto waiting ambulances, thank God for their salvation. I can't even express how I feel, she says. At the same time Russia has been shelling civilians, today it offered what it claimed were evacuation routes for them out of four Ukrainian cities. So-called humanitarian corridors, rejected by Ukraine because virtually every path leads to hostile territory in Russia or its ally Belarus. Ukrainian President Zelensky has strongly criticized President Biden and the West for not placing sanctions on Russia sooner to try to prevent the invasion. In a speech today, Zelensky again pleaded for a ban on the sale of Russian oil. Meanwhile, a senior U.S. defense official tonight says nearly 100 percent of Russia's troops that were on the Ukrainian border are now inside the country, though they continue to meet Ukrainian resistance, even in areas Russia now controls. 
Ukrainians lying down in front of Russian vehicles, even riding on top of one, waving a Ukrainian flag. Back in Kiev today, the main children's hospital took the difficult decision to evacuate the most fragile patients. Those unable to walk were lifted onto buses. Victoria is leaving behind her husband. He's staying in Kiev to fight. From the bus, the children and their parents are loaded onto a train bound for Lviv, nine hours away. War has reduced Ukraine to this, a train full of sick kids evacuating as the Russians close in. Victoria does her best to keep her baby Mark calm. How are you feeling right now? Bad, she says. I don't want to leave, but I have to. As the train set off for the West, for safer territory. And Tom, there was one potentially important development today coming out of Russia. And it could be a head fake, it could be a diplomatic maneuver, but Russia today seemed to dial back its demands. Instead of calling for regime change and total surrender, the Kremlin said it would stop the war immediately if Ukraine vowed never to join NATO or the EU or any bloc as, as it was described, and if it accepted Russia's control over Crimea and the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainian government may still reject it, but it is a significant difference from demanding the total capitulation of the Ukrainian government and the annihilation of the Ukrainian state as we know it. Tom? Richard Engel leading us off tonight on Top Story with that new reporting. Richard, thank you. Next tonight, this country is watching so many of its women and children on the move. They are getting out alive, but at what emotional price, especially for the very young? It's a new generation at risk facing an uncertain future. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt reports. A little boy with a toy car blissfully plays in his own fantasy world, thankfully oblivious, if just for a moment, to the real world spinning apart around him. At the Lviv train station, adults cramming into cars with volunteers or following lines that will lead them to anywhere but here for the sake of their children. Baby Anna won't remember any of this. Born in Kyiv six weeks premature in late January, hospitalized since birth, and then... We uh, had the grenades, the rockets. We were in the bomb shelter, but it was really scary. The war began around them. Every night we went from upstairs, it was the third floor, to the bomb shelter. Of the hospital? Yes, of the hospital. Zoya Filipova's husband had gone ahead with their other child, Zoya staying so that Anna could continue to receive medical care. There were less and less doctors attending us, uh, less and less treatment, and more and more going to the shelter. Mm. Uh, yeah, so we decided to, to go to Lviv. Yeah, we escaped by train. So what is your future? What is Anna's future now? Um, our future, so everything will be okay, definitely. <laughs> Ukraine will uh, win. There are so many children of this war, like young Alexander, showing me his teddy bear and his language skills. Hi, how are you? Who's your teddy bear? How are you? I, I, I'm, fine, sir. I'm fine, sir. You were fine. I'm not Who's sure if he heard or comprehended the weight of what his mom told me. I go in Poland. Going to Poland. Do, do you know where you will live? No. It is also achingly sad. They have escaped the chaos of war, the bombs and the missiles, and now they face the chaos of escape from their home country. Most of them, their lives surrounded in uncertainty. Tonight, the UN Refugee Agency reports 1.7 million Ukrainians have now crossed into Central Europe. Of that number, UNICEF now believes a million of them are children. Here where we are, we see tens of thousands of children flood through every day. They're, they're traumatized. Children don't cry anymore. That's a clear sign of trauma. But much of the world is crying for Ukraine and its children. What will you someday tell Anna about the world that she was born into? She, she's a child of a war, <laughs> basically. But she'll be okay, right? Yes. Yeah, you guys will be okay. 
so hard to see this war through the eyes of those mothers and those children. Lester Holt joins us now, live from here in Lviv. Lester, you know, you've covered so many wars before. You've covered disasters. What, what has struck you about this one that is different? I think the scale is, is certainly different. I think the immediacy of the people have to get out of the country. Their lives turned upside down in less than a couple of weeks. You know, I, I talked at the end of my broadcast tonight about, you know, what were these people doing two weeks ago? They were doing mundane things, going to the dentist and going to work and going to school. And, and now this. Yeah, and Lester, you know, many people that I've spoken to, and I know you encountered this as well, they left because their children was the motivating factor, right? They wanted to save their children. They're now coming to places like Lviv. They're going to Poland and Hungary, Slovakia. But once there, they're being helped right now. But the big question is what happens in a couple of weeks? And I know you were asking families this as well. What, what happens in the months ahead once this war drags on? Yeah, I mean, these people are, are, I mean, literally making their plans in the back of a napkin. I mean, things are unfolding so quickly, and they'll get a phone number, and there is an incredible support network, certainly uh, here in Ukraine and outside in Poland and these other countries. But the short answer is people don't really know. Um, you know, you heard that in that story, a woman saying, you know, she's, you know, going to Poland. Do you have a place to stay? I, I don't know. And, and it's, a, it's the uncertainty, I think, that is, the, is, is one of the horrific byproducts of all that's happening here. All right, Lester Holt for us tonight right here on Top Story. And you can see much more of Lester's developing coverage inside Ukraine tomorrow at 9 p.m. exclusively on NBC News Now. All right. Well, some families, however, never make it out of the horror. New York Times journalists caught in the moment where a uh, suspected Russian mortar hit civilians and killed the family of four, including two children. Our Katie Turr spoke to the journalist earlier today. Here's some of that conversation. And we want to warn you, some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. I went very early yesterday morning uh, to try to catch that scene of civilians crossing. And right after I arrived, I could sense that the mood was different. Um, there was a lot of tension in the air. There weren't that many civilians coming across, though there was a steady stream. Um, we found a position where there were uh, Ukrainian military lined up behind a brick wall, a cement wall. And they were not taking positions, but they were there primarily to help civilians across. So we were standing behind this wall and about 15 minutes in and a mortar round came uh, at us, but about 200 meters away. Slowly, they kept uh, sort of zeroing in on the position of the path of the civilians. Mortar came between us and the family, uh, and you said the mother and two of her children were killed, and uh, someone who had been helping them cross, a family friend, uh, were unsure whether he survived. Of course, we've heard that Russia is targeting civilians. We, we've seen footage, but for me, as a New York Times photographer, I have to see it and document it. And this was a situation where I literally watched the Russian military bracket their mortar strikes onto a civilian path. To me, it was clearly intentional. The path of the civilians was very known, and there was no mistake that it was targeting civilians. I spoke to people today who said that when they uh, ventured to leave uh, to escape from Irpin today across that little river, uh, people were looking at them like, like they were completely nuts, like they were heading towards certain death. Fortunately, they survived and uh, made it out okay. I think uh, President Zelensky has the same mindset as uh, his countrymen, which uh, country people, which is uh, this grim determination and uh, unwillingness to back down and uh, keep fighting till the end. Uh, Zelensky is on the same wavelength as the people. And uh, now that Russia is targeting civilians uh, as it seems to be unable to fight the armed forces directly without taking uh, unacceptable losses. They're trying to force this uh, some kind of uh, psychological break or surrender or something through uh, this kind of pressure on civilians. But that's not enough to break uh, Ukraine or uh, Zelensky, in my opinion. Two journalists from The New York Times, part of the large team here covering this war, with the humanitarian crisis in Europe growing worse every hour. I want to bring in Rafael Kostrzynski. He's the spokesman for the U.N.'s refugee agency in Poland. Rafael, I want to ask you, first of all, you know, we just heard in Lester's report there 
About a million Ukrainians are pouring into Poland right now. We know that your country is taking them in and feeding them and trying to take care of all these people. Is there enough of, of, of an infrastructure there to take the wave of refugees coming out of this country? Good evening. Well, for the time being, there is. Most of the refugees that come from Ukraine to Poland, they do not apply for international protection. They rather stay with their families, their relatives, or they have uh, money to, um, uh, to uh, provide for themselves to find accommodation on their own. Uh, there are, of course, people who are in, in need of uh, more um, substantial assistance, but uh, like I said, for the time being, the infrastructure is there. Of course, when the influx gets bigger and bigger, and it's getting bigger by the day, uh, more infrastructure will be needed, of course, and more uh, sustainable solutions will also will be have to applied. As you know, Ukraine is trying to work with Russia to develop these humanitarian corridors, essentially a no-fire, ceasefire zone where they can get their people out of the war zone. And then Russia decides to suggest that they're okay with this. Maybe we can even allow them to evacuate to Russia or Belarus. Did you find that suggestion despicable on the part of the Russians? Well, we are mostly interested in the safety of the civilians evacuated. It's uh, less important where they are evacuated, provided that they are safe, that they have access to uh, to but, but, um, protection. But Rafal, but, but Rafal to, 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 people are trying to flee. They're trying to flee Russian attacks. And for Russia to offer them a safe haven in the country that is invading them, don't you think that was a slap in the face to the, to the, in the international That's community? That's obviously uh, that's obviously a, there is a better solution, of course. I mean, uh, them evacuating uh, to the parts of Ukraine where there is no war right now, no no um, military activities, or to Poland would be a would be a better solution, of course. But here, what is the most important thing right now is the human human lives, and this is what we care uh, what we care most. Like I said, the best solution would be to evacuate them to where they are safe and they have uh, access to, to protection, to to uh, and they where, where their needs can be met. Ukraine is home to 44 million people, as you know. The UN initially estimated 4 million people would be leaving this country during this humanitarian crisis. I've been covering this for more than a week now. I'm not an expert, but I, I I'm sure that number is going to be higher. Do, do you think the number will be much higher than four million, possibly ten million? Well, to me, when we were when we first estimated a number at four million, um, it now looks like it was a conservative estimation. Now it looks like uh, there are going to be much more people uh, fleeing the war than we first estimated before the war started, because we were prepared for uh, for four million people. Uh, now we have reached 1.8 actually right now, and more than one million crossed the border into Poland. And if the situation does not improve immediately, we are surely going to to face um, even a bigger influx. I'm not. Uh, I hope I'm wrong uh, in these calculations. But um, if the war escalates uh, further, then the numbers are very likely to increase beyond the num the, the, the four million figure. Rafael, as you were talking, our director was rolling images of these mothers and these children fleeing with only what they can carry. Uh, you see the desperation in their eyes. The children are crying. I, I really hope that people, not only in America but across the world, never grow tired of these images, that they don't change the channel, that they don't forget about these people. How can people at home watching this broadcast help tonight? Yeah, these, these images definitely they are breaking my heart right now. Uh, people uh, can help by providing basic assistance uh, right now. International community can donate to UNHCR, to other international organizations that provide assistance or strive to provide assistance in Ukraine for, for the internally displaced people or outside Ukraine. 
in the in the countries that um, that take the most of the burden. Uh, this is this is what we can do as uh, as international community or as uh, ordinary civilians. Rafal, we thank you for your time. Uh, we thank you for your work, and we, we know you're going to be working around the clock to help all these millions of Ukrainians who are trying to find a safe haven tonight. We thank you again. Um, we also want to turn now to a troubling story one of our reporters came across here in Ukraine. As the refugee crisis deepens, hundreds of Indian students are now trapped in eastern Ukraine, desperate for supplies, even melting snow for drinking water. A third partial ceasefire now creating a humanitarian corridor near this area where they are pinned down. Zinclay Esamwa has more on their fight for a safe escape. Tonight, at least 700 Indian students trapped in Ukraine, according to India's government and students on the ground, now pleading for rescue. We may not die with this war zone, but we will die with scarcity of water and food. In verified video, students even melted snow for drinking water. I think God have shown some mercy, so we are getting water via snowfall. And you can see, guys, no water. Have you and other international students tried to get out? We are waiting for advisories because we don't want to be, you know, any casualty. Verified reports show many students still bunkered at Sumi University by the Russian border. Shivangi Jashwal is one of them. Everyone is here. Freaking out. She's seen airstrikes in the sky, gunfire on the sidewalk, and military on the roads. We heard some missile sound. As you can see that everyone is moving to bunkers. Nasser Kehami, a spokesperson for an Indian student group, has been advocating for trapped students online. We are receiving hundreds of calls per day from their families who are very much concerned. Verified video shows more student groups pleading for help. We are afraid. We have awaited a lot and we cannot wait anymore. What is being done to get these students out? There is no proper response from the Indian government. The government of India did not immediately respond for comment. But on Monday, India's prime minister called Russian President Vladimir Putin to express deep concern, quote, for the safety and security of these Sumi students. For Josh Wall, she now has electricity and fresh water, but the supplies haven't subdued her fears. Are you afraid for your life at all? Yeah, sometimes when we hear bombing. We have seen a very beautiful Ukraine and we are seeing it destroyed. Zin Clay joins us now from 30 Rock in New York. Zin Clay, I, I mean, I, I really can't believe this story. We're not talking about a few exchange students here. We're talking about hundreds of Indian citizens. W what are they doing tonight? What is the, the country of India doing to try to help its own people to get out of this country? Yeah, Tom, it's really mind-boggling to hear the accounts from these students. And Indian officials have spoken with both President Putin of Russia and President Zelensky of Ukraine, quote, strongly urging both sides to have a ceasefire. And that, of course, is so they can safely evacuate their citizens, Tom. Russian authorities say there will be a ceasefire, which is good news that these students were eager to hear because the conditions they're in, frankly, are not sustainable. Shivangi shared with me that aside from the physical toll, the strain on her mental health is one of the biggest challenges right now. And she's not alone in her plight, Tom. Sumi University said Saturday that 1,700, 1,700 foreign students currently live in their dorms. So this is something we need to watch super closely, Tom. Unbelievable. All right, Zinclay Asimov with some very powerful interviews tonight and a powerful report. Zinclay, thank you. Next, we want to take a look at American troops training with NATO forces in Latvia. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on NATO's front lines in the Baltics calling for a democratic wall against Russia. NBC's Josh Letterman is there with exclusive reporting on their training. Tonight, American troops barely 100 miles from the Russian border, ready to take on any threat running through drills in Latvia alongside NATO allies, preparing for a range of battlefield scenarios. I never thought I'd be able to train with the NATO allies like this. It's a decades-old mission with fresh purpose. These troops training on Russia's doorstep in a country that some fear could become Putin's next target. It certainly gives us a sense of urgency. All of the training that we're, we're conducting right now is, is very focused on, on what we would have to do to to defend uh, Latvia. The U.S. has deployed another 800 troops to the Baltics, 
They're among roughly 100,000 U.S. troops now in Europe. It's always experience get your heart pumping. After Russia invaded Ukraine, the U.S. moved 20 of these Apache attack helicopters from Germany to here in Latvia to shore up NATO's defenses. Paratroopers here are practicing urban warfare, like the kind playing out in the snowy streets of Kyiv. Putin has called NATO's expansion into Eastern Europe a threat, but NATO says it seeks no conflict just to defend its members, like it did after 9-11. When my nation was attacked, uh, NATO uh, rallied together. Tonight, a new rallying cry for NATO, with Europe's future at stake. These NATO troops here in Latvia will be continuing their exercises throughout the week and are part of broader drills that NATO is conducting across Europe involving almost 13,000 people from 13 NATO allies. And tonight, the U.S. announcing it's sending another 500 troops to Europe to even further shore up NATO's defenses. Tom? Josh Letterman with that exclusive report tonight. Josh, thank you. Back in the States, many feeling the growing economic consequences of this war, most notably at the gas pump, where prices have surged above $4 a gallon, levels not seen in years. Jolyn Kent has that story. Tonight, record-breaking prices at the pump nationwide. It's actually killing my budget. You feel it, but you just kind of keep going. The average for a gallon of regular is now more than $4.10, surpassing the previous record in 2008. Prices skyrocketing nearly 50 cents a gallon over just the last seven days. In California, drivers spotting an eye-popping $7 a gallon in Los Angeles. Across the country, the biggest jumps are in Rhode Island, Nevada, Connecticut, Kentucky, and Alabama. See, I could go about two more weeks on this. After this, I'm just going to spark the car up and just jump on the bus. And soon, it'll go beyond the pump. Experts warn that rising gas prices will lead to more expensive plane tickets. Overnight, crude oil prices reaching levels not seen since the 2008 financial crisis. We are now in, uh, in very active discussions with our European partners uh, about banning the, uh, the import of Russian oil. Russia, whose economy is heavily dependent on energy exports, accounts for nearly 10 percent of the global oil supply. While an import ban could cripple Russia's economy, analysts say it would also trigger even higher gas prices here at home. If you knew that paying more would mean a better outcome for the invasion of Ukraine, would you do that? Short answer, yes, of course. If that means paying an extra few dollars, then take it. <laughs> and the price that you're paying is expected to continue to rise. Gas Buddy now anticipating the national average could go up another 40 to 50 cents a gallon in the coming days and weeks. Tom? Joe Link Kent there in California with prices north of $7 a gallon. Wow. All right, our coverage from Ukraine continues later in this broadcast, but now we turn to my friend and colleague Kate Snow in New York with tonight's other major headlines. Kate, good evening. Tom, thanks so much for all you're doing there. And still ahead on Top Story tonight, a gruesome discovery in Florida. The body of a missing woman found in a septic tank. The handyman now arrested for her murder. Plus, the boat running aground in the Florida Keys with hundreds of migrants on board, some trying to swim to shore. The investigation just launched. And the deadly tornadoes touching down in Iowa. Millions of Americans now under the threat of severe thunderstorms. We have the timing up next. Stay with us. Back now with an exclusive look inside the CDC, the agency reeling from two years of a worldwide pandemic, its role shifting as many states are now seeing lower levels of the virus. I sat down with CDC officials about what's next. It has been a hard two years. Dr. Henry Walk is taking us to the CDC's Emergency Operations Center. This is the nerve center, really, of the CDC response. Before the pandemic, it would have been packed. For now, many CDC employees are still working remotely. This is a measure of the impact of COVID-19. But in most of the country, things are shifting. Green means low community levels. Yellow is medium. Orange is high. We're seeing more green, more of the yellow. And, and that's hopefully, good news. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we'll see in the next in the next month or two that the majority of the country actually will be green. Just days it after we be, visited, the map got greener. Trips like this to Missouri, this is a new thing. This is among my first. It's really been amazing. We met up with CDC director Dr. Rochelle Walensky as she visited a clinic in St. Louis. Here's the big question. Is it over? I don't know. 
Um, and that's, you know, the honest truth. Um, we certainly hope so. We certainly have a lot of immunity in the population. More and more people getting vaccinated, more and more people getting boosted. We have some immunity from prior infection. But uh, with certainty, we don't know. Are we nearing a new phase? I think we are in a new phase where we can start to getting back to doing many of the things that we have liked to do and where we have to remain vigilant. Do you see COVID turning into something more like the flu as we move forward? I do anticipate that this is probably going to be a seasonal virus. It may be seasonal around the time other respiratory viruses thrive. So that The would way be the flu is? The way the flu is. Dr. Walensky says it's time for most of us to put the masks away. I would say put your masks in a drawer, anticipate you may need them again, and hope that we don't. People are going to welcome that advice. <laughs> don't shred them. <laughs> Just as many kids are returning to classrooms without masks, some data suggests the vaccine for children is less effective now. Though the CDC recommends kids 5 to 11 get vaccinated, Florida's Surgeon General said today the state will officially recommend against the vaccine for healthy children. Should parents of 5 to 11-year-olds be concerned that the vaccine their kids got isn't good enough. I would say parents 5 to 11 should anticipate that their child may need a booster dose um, and get their kids vaccinated. Have you let parents down? Um, this has been a hard time. Um, uncertainty is hard. Um, and if you want anything as a parent, you want certainty that your kid's going to be okay. I can see that it, it, it almost looks like it pains you yeah. as a parent. Yeah, well, I, I, I am, yes. You can, you can relate. <laughs> Absolutely. When my kids ask me about something that they may or may not be able to do, um, an event that they may or may not be able to have or go to, um, I, I, I feel that. If you were a betting person, Dr. Walensky, <laughs> would, you, would you think that we're likely to have more variants? Or is it just um, impossible to say? It is impossible to say um, I, we can decrease our chances by getting more and more people vaccinated. Just a year ago, the CDC had insufficient data and sequencing capabilities. Now it says it's ramped up genetic sequencing to help detect new variants. Does the CDC have enough tools now to recognize a new variant popping up in the U.S.? Yeah, we feel pretty confident in the level of, of detection, being able to detect a new variant. New hope as the nation enters a new chapter. Dr. Walk also told me that he's hopeful that if there is another variant, it won't have the severe consequences that we've seen from others. We turn to weather now, a deadly weekend of severe storms rocking the Midwest, a massive EF4 tornado. Take a look at this, ripping through parts of Iowa this weekend, killing seven people, leaving behind a trail of destruction, damaging almost 52 homes. Treacherous weather also hitting the west, heavy snowfall in Denver, creating dangerous conditions on the road. More than 50 cars crashing in six separate pileups on Sunday. And that storm threat continuing today for millions of people. Let's get to NBC meteorologist is Michelle Grossman with the track of it. Michelle? Hi there, Kate. Yeah, we're seeing that storm system taking aim on the northeast right now. It's moving through very, very quickly with winds up to 70 miles per hour. Let's go ahead and take a look at radar, show you where it is right now, because you can see it stretching all the way from New England down to the southeast. You see the yellows, the reds, the oranges. That is your heavier rain, and we could see the potential for some flooding. Zooming in a little closer here, we're seeing some stronger storms move through the state of Pennsylvania. We've had history of 70 mile per hour winds there with power outages, tree limb damage as well. And that's going to be the case as we head throughout the next several hours. So severe threat into tonight, 37 million Americans at risk from Atlanta to Charlotte, Roanoke, up to D.C., also Philadelphia. Wind, that's going to be the biggest threat here. Winds gusting 50, 60, 70 miles per hour, so 64 million Americans. Where you see the blue here from Boston to Albany to Altoona, Pennsylvania, down to D.C., also Blacksburg, uh, Virginia, we are looking at gusty winds tonight. I can hear those winds outside my home studio now. Now, that active pattern continues tonight. So we'll see that cold front move off the coast, showers stretching tomorrow from Texas to the Carolinas, and then we could see training storms. That's where a storm kind of sits and spins and drops a lot of rain in a short amount of time. Kate? All right, Michelle, thank you. When we come back, Bill Cosby will remain a free man. The Supreme Court of the U.S. rejected an attempt to have Cosby's conviction reinstated, what this now means for his accusers.
Now to Top Stories news feed, and we begin with a disturbing discovery in Florida. The body believed to be that of a missing woman found in the septic tank in her backyard in Jensen Beach. 57-year-old Cynthia Cole was last seen a week and a half ago. Her handyman charged with murder over the weekend. A motive is not clear. Up next, rescue crews bringing hundreds of Haitian migrants to safety in the Florida Keys. Officials say this overcrowded boat was part of a smuggling operation. It ran aground in shallow water. A local border patrol chief says about 300 people were on board and more than 150 of them swam to shore. Many of them needed medical attention. Authorities say an investigation is ongoing. Up next tonight, the U.S. Supreme Court has declined to review the decision that freed Bill Cosby from prison last year, a spokesperson for Cosby calling the decision a victory. The 84-year-old served three years in maximum security prison after a jury found him guilty of sexually assaulting Andrea Constant at his Pennsylvania home in 2004. But the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled last year that the decision to charge Cosby in 2015 violated his due process. That's because the district attorney back in 2005 had made an agreement not to charge the comedian in exchange for his deposition in a civil case. But later a new DA filed criminal charges and used Cosby's own words in that deposition to make a case. After Cosby was released from prison, I spoke exclusively with Andrea Constant. When you watched him celebrate, how did that feel to see him talking about the first meal he had and... Disgusting. But again, didn't didn't surprise me given the the level of the the arrogance and having no remorse. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins me now for a closer look at all this. Danny, why do you think the U.S. Supreme Court decided to just stay out of it? We won't know because this is one of those orders where the Supreme Court reviews it and doesn't give us their reasons why they're declining to hear the case on what's called certiorari. So they are declining cert. We'll never know the reasons why, but it may be the case that the Supreme Court, as it often likes to do, likes to leave cases that were decided on independent state grounds alone at the lower court. In this case, the lower court is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And so now for Bill Cosby, is this the end of the line? Does this mean no more legal troubles for him? This means the end of this case and no other case. Although, uh, were there other cases in Pennsylvania that the prosecutor could have brought within the statute of limitations, uh, he would have. So we can expect this may be the end of his criminal cases in Pennsylvania for the time being. As far as civil cases, uh, who knows? There may still be victims out there, some we may never have even heard about. So it's impossible to say whether Bill Cosby's legal woes are completely behind him. But this case uh, involving this victim, you can safely say for him, is over. Danny, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the fire at a high-rise building in London. Cell phone video shows flames shooting out the 17th floor, burning debris also falling to the ground. Firefighters used a 210-foot ladder to help reach the flames. The surrounding area was blocked off. No one was injured. Officials are now investigating the cause. New satellite images may suggest that North Korea is resuming testing of atomic bombs. Analysts say the new images from Maxar show construction at a nuclear test site in North Korea for the first time in years. North Korea claimed to have destroyed the missile site in 2018. A spokesperson for the CIA says the agency is not commenting. Tonight, as clashes continue overseas, Ukrainian Americans are working together to collect supplies for Ukrainian troops and refugees, proving that distance will not deter them from contributing to the war effort. Shaquille Brewster is in Chicago with their story. The donations come in by the carloads. Diapers, wipes. I have about 400 pair of socks. Boxes of diapers, food, medical supplies purchased by Americans heartbroken by a tragedy thousands of miles away. Catastrophic what's happening and everyone feels the same way and we feel like helpless, like how can we help them somehow? Since Russia's invasion, this Ukrainian shipping service has taken on a new mission, converting its offices into sorting centers, already sending six trucks, more than 90 tons of supplies to Poland where it will then be brought across the border to Ukraine. People are doing a great job, but um, uh, we need more. We need help. 
Uh, we need uh, help from government because people are, are dying in Ukraine. This operation, powered by an army of volunteers, many with family living in Ukraine, seeing this as their way to fight. Everybody has to do their part. So somebody has to find and hold the gun at the front line and somebody has to bring the medicine to help people that were injured. You're part of that fight. Oh, absolutely. But with the determination, there's also frustration seen in massive weekend rallies that have repeatedly drawn thousands to the streets of Chicago, home to more than 50,000 people with Ukrainian heritage. We have to support. We cannot just leave it and watch it. That's public execution. Until the bombing ends, the work here continues. Do you think you can sustain this effort for weeks and months to come if this war goes on? Well, the Ukrainians are a hardy bunch. Ukrainian Americans prepared to support for the long run, but praying the end of suffering is near. We've been watching these donations pour in all day long. In fact, everything that you see behind me, from the sleeping bags to the tent to the diapers that have already been loaded onto the truck were donated today alone. You're getting the sense that people are doing whatever they can from wherever they can to support the people of Ukraine. Kate? Shaq, thank you. Coming up, our coverage from inside Ukraine continues. Tom Yama speaks to a member of the Ukrainian parliament, what she told us about life inside. Welcome back to a special edition of Top Story reporting from Ukraine. You're seeing journalists run for cover after heavy shelling near Kyiv. Just a snippet of all the ongoing conflict in this country. I want to bring in now a member of Ukraine's parliament, Lisa Yasko. Lisa, thank you for joining Top Story. I know this is an incredibly tough time for you and your family. I want to ask you about some comments you made about your president, Vladimir Zelensky. You think that if the Russians get their hands on him, they will ultimately execute him? I'm sure this is what they want. They want to kill him and to forget that there is uh, that this courage actually exists in in the world. Uh, President Zelensky shows lots of courage and, and leadership, and he is not scared. And the Russians really miscalculated that. What did you think of the family that was killed over the weekend when Russian forces attacked civilians who were trying to evacuate just outside of Kiev? It's a big tragedy, but unfortunately, it's not an individual case. There are many people, civilians and children, that are killed by snipers and by explosions and by shellings. Yesterday, one person I knew was killed. Uh, he's an actor. Lisa, I know you've done a lot of interviews, and you have to stay strong for your people. And, and because, you know, you're, you're essentially a, a public spokesperson for your country, but, I mean, to lose your friend... And to lose all those people that are that are just civilians in your country, that has to be so difficult. It's incredibly difficult. And uh, it's a hell. It's a real hell. But somehow I understand that this is the fight. Uh, we don't have a choice, you know. There are two ways. Whether you give up and you never see Ukraine or you keep fighting with even all the losses and you keep that faith that that price that we pay is going to bring a real result of of killing evil and uh, i'm sure that now we are not only defending ukraine we are defending future of humanity and i'm sure that putin is going to fail if he's not going to fail tomorrow physically in his state in Russia, he will fail in any way because he is committing war crimes right now against Ukrainian people. Top story back now reporting from Ukraine. That moving performance you see there, a little girl's rendition of Let It Go from the movie Frozen. Her stage of bomb shelter in Kyiv her song, a brief distraction for those huddled alongside her. That little girl, like so many children we've met, caught in the crosshairs of this war. Last week, we introduced you to some of the most vulnerable victims of this conflict at an orphanage here in Lviv. That report reaching parents back home in the U.S. who recognize the kids they've been trying to adopt for years. Tonight, our conversations with two of those families now desperately trying to get their kids to safety. 
the mass exodus in Ukraine reaching historic levels. Now, the fastest growing refugee crisis since World War II. I just uh, left my home to nowhere. I have no plan. I just want to, to save my child. Protecting children is fueling the migration from the fighting in the east to safe havens in the west. These children you see here may be in the worst possible position because they're orphans. They do not have family. They are in limbo right now. They are being taken care of. They're being fed. But like everyone else in Ukraine at this moment, no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Last Friday, we introduced you to a group of Ukrainian orphans evacuated from the war zone. Eight-year-old Demetrius told us how he hopes to still be adopted. What do you want uh, the world to know about Ukraine? No, shop, uh, no. He told me he wants the war to stop. Anything you want to say to anybody, friends back in that other region? Demetrius's answer shook me because it's the reality of this war. I want them to stay alive, not to die. Our story hit close to home for several families back in the U.S. because they recognized children they were trying to adopt. I said, oh my gosh, look, this is this is Vicha, is what we call him, and he was eating. Vicha came up to us asking to be on camera. He spent summers and winters in Iowa, getting to know the Heineck family, who wants to adopt him and his two siblings. He's just like so special and he wants to be with us so bad, and we have to say, you know, we can't come today and we're waiting. Do you have any idea where the process stands now with the war? Well, right now all the uh, uh, offices over there are closed, so right now the, the adoption process is in a standstill. Our question is, is will we ever see them again? Especially Russia has banned adoptions to American citizens and hosting since 2013. The Heineks tell us there are at least 300 American families in the same boat. Because it's kind of like they're at that reach, but you can't get to them. The Romeros also recognized a child they're trying to adopt. The couple is now in Poland, on the border, helping refugees, but also trying to move along the adoption of their child, who they say texts them every day that he's afraid of the war. To me, it's not even just about the adoption. It's what happens when Lviv is next on the list. For the last two years, in my heart, he's been my son, and it doesn't matter what's written on paper, and it doesn't matter what the law says, but he's my son. And I just want to hug him. And again, we feel for all those American families trying to get the kids they hope to adopt out of Ukraine. For those of you at home who want to help the children you just saw in a report here in Lviv, you can do so by visiting the website that they are collecting funds for right there on your screen. The link is also on the Top Story Instagram and Twitter pages. I want to thank you tonight for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas reporting again from Ukraine. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.